but we don't have a, a vaccine for HIV AIDS, although that's been around for 25 years. We don't have a vaccine for tuberculosis, which is a disease that kills most people in the world every year, and that's been around for, for centuries. And the question is, well, why do we think we're going to get a vaccine for COVID-19 so quickly? Hi, I'm Professor Jamie Trickers. Welcome to my masterclass on development of vaccines against COVID-19. So I guess one of the, the first points and one of the things that I get asked quite a bit about is will we have a new vaccine for COVID-19? And I'll get asked that by by my children, by my, uh, my neighbours and certainly uh, some of my colleagues. And I think it's important to put that in the context of some of the other diseases that we have that people hear about and we don't have vaccines. So for example, we don't have a, a vaccine for HIV AIDS, although that's been around for 25 years. We don't have a vaccine for tuberculosis, which is a disease that kills most people in the world every year and that's been around for, for centuries. And the question is, well, why do we think we're going to get a vaccine for COVID-19 so quickly? And there's a number of reasons for that. I think one of the important points is that many of the vaccines or many of the diseases that we don't have vaccines for are very complex. So we need to develop quite complex immune responses against those pathogens. For example, tuberculosis, we need to develop what we call a T-cell response, which is very different to some of the existing vaccines that we have. Uh, HIV mutates very quickly and very rapidly, so it's a very difficult organism to get a handle on. In the case of COVID-19 or for SARS-CoV-2, what we do know is that, from what we've seen from patients, is that we generate antibody responses in people who are infected that are the type of responses we think will be protective against infection. And so this is a very important thing for making a new vaccine. The other important thing to note, and again, something that's brought up as a distinction is, well, we had similar viruses such as SARS and such as MERS, uh, which uh, came out over the last 10, 15 years. Why don't we have vaccines to those, because, even though they're similar viruses? Well, the, the question there relates to, I guess, the, the intensity of those infections and how long they last, and then the interest in those diseases. So for SARS, it was here for a very short time, uh, it caused a reasonably high number of deaths in that short time and then it disappeared. So in fact, a lot of the funding for those particular infections disappeared with the, the virus itself. So I don't think it was the case that we can't make vaccines against coronaviruses. It's just that here we have a coronavirus that is uh, extremely problematic. We have a lot of investment and we have a lot of people racing to make a vaccine for COVID-19. So I think that's um, a very good starting point to think about, will we, will we have a vaccine? So the particular issue or the thing about uh, COVID-19 is that the immune response that develops after infection, and this is what we see in patients that we've looked at already. Now, keeping in mind that this uh, disease or outbreak has only been around for a few months, so it's, it's very difficult to know how long lasting this immune response is. But what we do see is that these individuals develop a, ver a reasonably strong antibody response. And antibodies are the basis, or making these responses are the basis of essentially all vaccines that we currently have, all vaccines that we use in children. So that's a good thing. So what we know is that we can generate strong antibody responses in people who uh, are infected. What we don't know is how long these antibody responses will last for. And obviously we want this to last for a long time, ideally for life but in a good case scenario, maybe 10, 15 years, sometimes even shorter. So we know that people who are infected with the virus make the right sort of antibody response. And what that response is specifically is these individuals make antibodies that can bind to the virus and stop it from entering into cells. And so that's a really critical point. So we call those neutralizing antibodies. And these are antibodies that neutralize the effect of the virus. They stop um, viral entry. So patients make these, but as I've mentioned, we don't know how long it lasts, um, and we don't know if everybody who gets infected makes these sort of responses. So this is, I guess, where we are, the point of vaccine development, is that most of the strategies are trying to make this type of immune response. And currently, 
as you may have heard in the, uh, in the media many times, we have over 100 different vaccine candidates. But in fact, many of these will be very similar approaches. I don't think we're going to say that we've got 100 different vaccines. We've got 100, uh, 100 vaccines that are based on completely different ways of doing it. Some of them are, are quite similar. So the pipeline of vaccines, uh, there's a number of different candidates. And I think what I'll do is go through the different classes of vaccines, because many of these have come up um, in terms of vaccines that are currently in humans or vaccines that are being developed in different places, in particular in Australia, for example. So there's, there's probably four really groups, uh, major groups of vaccines that we use. Now, the thing is that these are vaccine strategies that we use for other infections and that we've used historically. And probably the first class, and you would probably say the simplest class, not to underestimate what it takes to make a vaccine, are what we call the whole virus vaccines. So in this case, you inactivate the virus, you use some form of method to inactivate it so it can't grow, or you attenuate the virus. So what that means is that you modify it, its growth so it can't cause disease. And this is the basis for many vaccines, many childhood vaccines. So in the case of polio, for example, we have two forms of polio vaccine. We have an inactivated vaccine, which is called the Salk vaccine, and we have a, an attenuated vaccine, which is called the Sabine vaccine. And both these vaccines we use to um, almost eradicate polio. So we're almost there with polio. So those are early vaccine strategies that were developed 50, 60 years ago. And these were used very early on to try and um, deal with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 because that once we isolated the virus, we could start to make these vaccine strategies. And so there's a few of those in, in, that are being developed around the world. Now, what we will say is that compared to other strategies, there's not that many of them. And this probably comes back to an issue of safety. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And I think there's another um, masterclass talking about vaccine trials and safety. So the safety issue is, is one for those vaccines, and we'll talk about that. The second category are what we call viral vectored vaccines. So these are vaccines where we take another virus and we use that to make a vaccine against the virus of interest, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So there's a number, of, a number of ways we can do this. We can use uh, a naturally occurring virus that will replicate. So it's a different virus to the COVID-19 virus. And we put parts of that virus into or parts, sorry, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus into the viral vector. And we use this as a delivery strategy. And that's quite effective. And for example, we now have a vaccine for Ebola that um, uses this particular strategy itself. So that's one approach that's being used. Um, one of the issues with that approach is that if you use a vaccine or if you use a, a vaccine vector and it's a virus that's been circulating in people previously, those people might have immunity to that particular virus. So when you reintroduce it as a new vaccine, you might have troubles with generating a, a very good immune response. So that's one of the issues that people consider with using those. The second class of uh, viral vectors, and I guess one that's really been in the news of late, is what we call a non-replicating vector. And this is where we use a virus that is live in a sense, that it can get into cells, but it can't replicate to an extent that it, that it will become problematic. And an example of this is the vaccine that's being developed by the Oxford's group. So Oxford University are developing a, um, a vaccine that is now in human trials and they already have manufacturing going, et cetera. So it's probably one of the most advanced vaccines. So again, that's a, a strategy that makes use of viruses to develop new vaccines against different viruses. The third class, uh, nucleic acids. And this, again, I think is very topical because the very first vaccine for COVID-19 that went into humans was an RNA vaccine. So quite an unusual approach. And what you do here is you take RNA or DNA. That's another thing you can do. So these are um, components of the virus itself or particular vectors that you make containing components of the virus. And you inject these directly into the individual. And the reason why these were done early on is that it doesn't require any modification of a virus or making new vectors or making particular proteins in the, labor in the laboratory. It's relatively easy to generate uh, large amounts of these RNA or DNA vectors. 
and then you inject those um, into the individual. So that was the Moderna, who is the company in the United States who um, had this particular strategy in human trials very quickly. And again, I think in one of the other master classes, they may talk a little bit more about um, the vaccines, the particular vaccines in humans. So that's the, that's the third approach. Um, now, one other thing to note about that approach is that it's unproven in the sense that it hasn't been used in humans before, or we don't have a licensed vaccine using this, this new type of technology. And again, that's one thing I'll get to towards the end, thinking about safety. The last approach are protein-based vaccines, and this probably encapsulates most of the vaccine strategies that we have currently for, for COVID-19. So in this case, what you do is that you take a component of the virus, and it would be a surface protein, and, and one of the components is what we call the spike protein, uh, is what many, probably most of the groups are using for this strategy. So you take this component, you generate it uh, in a laboratory, you make large amounts of the protein, and then you deliver that to the individual. And initially that'll be animals, and then that'll be humans, uh, in the hope that you generate an immune response against the, the vaccine itself. The reason there's a lot of interest in this approach is because you can make a lot of this uh, particular vaccine protein in the laboratory and you can change it depending on what type of vaccine you want to make. So those are of course things that you can't do with the whole virus itself because in that case uh, you're modifying the virus where in the case of the protein vaccines you can change them genetically to develop different types of proteins if that's what you want to do. And so this, for example, is the, is the strategy that's being used at the University of Queensland. So the University of Queensland that we've heard a lot about in the news in the last few months is, is funded to develop uh, protein-based vaccines. And they have a particular, quite an innovative technology to ensure that the protein that's made is very stable and will generate good immune responses. And in fact, they've now seen that their vaccine generates immune responses in animal models. And I think they're moving towards human trials. So that's the, that's the different classes of, of vaccines that we currently have. The other important thing to note is that, well, we've got all of these candidates. We've got uh, 100 vaccines around the world. We've even got some here at the University of Sydney. So I'm involved in a, in a few vaccine research projects as well. Um, how can we determine if any of these are going to be useful in humans? Because of course we can't go straight into humans that's really not ethical. We need to ensure that the vaccine candidates work. They generate the right type of immune response. And we think we know what that is now. And they need to be safe. So there's four different models that people are using. And again, in the background of vaccine development, there was also a very big push to develop new animal models for, for SARS or for SARS-CoV-2. So the first model that people are using uh, are mice. And so mice are the model that we use historically for many uh, research programs in particular for vaccines. They're easy to handle, they're easy to breed. Um, the problem is that they don't get infected with SARS-CoV-2. So you can't naturally infect a mouse with this particular virus. What you can do is you can vaccinate them and you can determine if those animals generate an immune response. So they're quite useful for that. What you can't determine is if that immune response protects the animal against infection because you then can't subsequently infect those mice with the virus. They just clear the virus or the virus doesn't take hold. And that's all based on the fact that they don't have the right type of receptors for the virus to infect. So the way that we're getting around that is we're making forms of um, mouse strains that express the human receptor for the virus. So then what we call a transgenic mouse that will be able to um, become infected with the virus, and then you can test if your vaccines work. So that's the one model. The second model that people are using are hamsters. So hamsters are naturally, well, naturally infected. You can infect them, they become infected. And one of the things about hamsters is that they develop quite mild disease. So that may not be great in the sense of saying, well, if I've got a really great vaccine, does it protect against really strong COVID infection? What it does approximate probably is a lot of the disease in people because 80% of people get fairly mild disease. The other thing we know from the hamster studies is that hamsters can transmit the virus to each other within a colony. So they have that respiratory type of transmission that we see in humans. So I think that's, a, that's obviously very useful as well. Um, the next approach are ferrets. And ferrets again are quite topical because this is the model that's being used 
at CSIRO uh, in Geelong, so the animal facility there that are testing vaccines. And so they were the first people, I think, in the world to establish a ferret model of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this is quite important because these are naturally susceptible in that you can infect them. You don't need to modify them for them to become infected. They generate uh, respiratory infection. You get respiratory transmission. And again, it was reported in the media that CSIRO were testing two vaccine candidates. Uh, the were the first to test these two candidates in their model. One of them was the vaccine from Oxford. So that's one of the vaccines that's really being pushed. And so there's studies underway in Australia. So we're one of the first in Australia to test vaccines in this model. And the last model is, is non-human primates or monkeys. So these are considered probably to be the best model because obviously they will resemble more closely the, the infection or the situation in humans. Um, one of the issues is that they're very expensive and difficult to use. So there's only a few groups around the world that have the capacity to do these experiments. But there's been one report in the literature, so only one so far, that have shown, has shown that a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine works in animal models in monkeys using an inactivated version of the virus. So that was done by a Chinese group uh, and monkeys were protected against infection. So that was a really good sign. So I think the animal models are, some of them are already developed, some are being developed and they'll be very instructive and, and quite important for what we need to do in this space. So the other point to note, again, relating to this, is if we think about we've gone from animal models, we now need to go into humans to see if these vaccines work. And I won't get into time frames and human trials because this will be the, what you'll be talking about in one of the other masterclasses. But currently we have six vaccines in human trials. Um, I mentioned some of them. Some were brought in very early. Uh, some have been introduced more recently. And really the only point I want to make about this in detail is that it's interesting to note that out of the six candidates only one of them has been used before for a human an approved human vaccine so that was an in so the the vaccine i just mentioned an inactivated form of the virus that was uh, protective in monkeys has now been tested in humans all of the other vaccines are quite different technology so rna vaccines recombinant adenovirus some vaccines are very different. They're taking uh, cells of the immune system and manipulating them and then injecting them into people. So I think this is great that we have all this innovation, but I also think it's, it's well, potentially problematic in the sense that I'm not quite sure if, if this is the space where we want to have this race for innovative technology. We probably, what we do need to develop something quickly is uh, a strategy that we know will be safe and effective. So I think a lot of the, I guess, old school technology that, that people are moving away from will probably be the ones that will come up with some of our good vaccines. But certainly some of these other approaches will as well. So for example, the, the Oxford vaccine that I've spoken a little bit about, it's a, a modified virus. Um, we know that these type of vaccines can generate immune responses in humans and they can protect animals from infection for other diseases and even for diseases such as SARS and, and MERS. So I think that's got a really good shot. So although it's a new technology, there's a lot of groundwork that's been done previously to show that it may work. Some of the other things such as RNA vaccines, a little bit different. There's been some evidence in humans as well, but well, it's a newer approach and we don't know how that's gonna pan out. So I think there's some great candidates in there. I think there's other ones that are going to come through in the next few months that will really expand that, that pool of vaccines. And I'm pretty confident that out of those we'll see uh, a couple of really strong candidates. And, and the issue will then become, can you scale these up to the size that we need to essentially vaccinate the world, which is you know, obviously huge. So the other, the, probably just the last thing I'll, I'll touch on is related to safety. So I mentioned a few things about safety and using different vaccines. The reason why there's a lot of concern about this is that what was shown in SARS, now keep in mind that SARS is a, is a virus that is 70, 80% similar to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, hence the very similar names, I guess. So these are very similar viruses. They appear to cause quite similar pathology from what we've seen in animals, although again, that's not that well um, fleshed out just yet because we don't have all the systems we need. Um, the antibody targets appear to be the same. And what was happening in, in SARS 
uh, virus technology or, or vaccine development was that a number of the vaccine candidates when tested in humans, those animals, once they were, so the animals were vaccinated, then they were given the virus, they would generate what we would consider to be a protective response, but we'd also see uh, excessive disease in the lungs of these animals. And what was happening is that they were generating different types of antibody responses. So they were generating a good antibody response, and they were also generating an anti antibody response that was bad in the sense that it was allowing the um, virus to infect cells to a greater extent. So this was quite problematic, and we called this uh, antibody-dependent depend enhancement of infection. Uh, and this is something that was seen in a number of, of SARS vaccines. In animal trials, this, none of these vaccines have been tested in humans to this extent. So of course the big question will always be, if these viruses are so similar, are we going to see the same thing? Are we going to see when we vaccinate, which what we think are good vaccines, are we going to enhance the disease? And that's the big question. So I think that's where a lot of concern is about, we're pushing very fast to get vaccines out as quickly as we can. But I think for this virus, there is this background of concern about enhancement of disease potentially with some vaccine candidates. So I think we do need some level of rigor in determining which are the best candidates that we move through to later trials. Because the thing to note is that in an early phase one trial, so all you're doing there is you're testing people to see if they make an immune response. And I shouldn't say it's not all you're doing, it's quite important, but you're testing to see, is the vaccine safe in that setting? Are these people generating an immune response? And that's why we have a number in trials already. Generally, these are, in, these are individuals who probably won't get reinfected or infected with the virus itself, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So you're unlikely to see this problem occur. It's when you get into the situation where you vaccinate people and then these are in an environment or in a population where there's high level of the virus that you'll start to get infection, natural infection of your vaccinated population. And in fact, we're now talking about human challenge trials where we potentially give people the virus after they've been infected. So that's another uh, issue that's being discussed. And that's where you'll potentially see these problems. So we probably won't see these issues in the early vaccine trials, but we may see them in the later, later vaccine trials. But what I think will happen is that we will use the animal models to essentially weed out the, the vaccines that might induce this effect. So we move forward with, with the safest vaccines. Mm -hmm.